This last week, I had the opportunity to go down with some of our other uh, people here from Connection to a a leadership training event uh, where some of the other church planters from the Nexus family were gathered together. And uh, one of the things that we did uh, for fun time was to go to this retro style arcade. You know, the kind where you just, you pay an admission to get in, but you don't have to pump the quarters. And, uh, and it's been a long time since I played a lot of these games. I mean, there was, there was everything from Pong to uh, like the original Mario Brothers and gosh, so much more asteroids and, and things like that. How many of you are gamers? Any gamers in here? And so back in the day, and, and you may have to go back a few minutes, like you didn't have a memory card. You didn't have a hard drive to save things to. And so if you got stuck, like you just had to go there again to get there. And sometimes you realized your ability level uh, was not good enough to get there unless you had all of your lives intact because you knew there were certain spots where you just weren't going to make it. And sometimes you would do something, well, kind of dumb, and you would end up dying too fast. And so you would just hit, I would hit the reset button, go back and start it over again and try again. Anybody else do that? Reset. Anybody ever wish there was a reset button on life? It, it wouldn't like you'd have to reset the whole thing, just like a day, like Groundhog's Day, just boop, let's just try this one over again, because uh, it kind of stunk, or I kind of stunk, or whatever the case might be. Sometimes I feel that with my golf game, can I just go back and replay this shot again, or this hole again, and wanting to, to make sure that I'm moving forward, well, we get kind of a reset in Exodus, So chronologically going through the Old Testament this year, we went through Genesis. If you're sticking with us about 10 chapters a week, man, you've already knocked out the book of Genesis. And Exodus just comes on the heels of that. It's it's right away, the next thing, and where we left off with, God has miraculously provided uh, uh, just an opportunity for the Israelites. In the midst of famine, God spoke to Joseph, put him in a unique position, uniquely qualified him to provide for the family of the Israelites. And then we pick up in Exodus chapter 1 and see there's a new generation. It's a generational reset. Something that we'll see throughout the Old Testament is like, this generation did this, but the next generation, they kind of went this way. And it kind of goes back and forth, good, bad, and otherwise. So Exodus chapter 1 is on page 45 in the Black Bibles we provide. If you'd like to turn there with me. And we're going to pick up in uh, verse 6. Uh, verses 6 through 10 in Exodus chapter 1. And it's going to kind of set this stage for us because it says in 6, Then Joseph died, and all of his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. So one generation has passed, and another generation is coming. Verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt. Remember, Joseph was second in command. He kind of had some clout. He no longer has clout. He's dead. New people stepping up. New king doesn't know them. And he said to the people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. They realized that they had some free laborers. They also realized that the opposition could grow strong with them and they could overtake them. And so in fear, they oppressed the Israelites. All of the ones that were brought there because of of God's provision through a famine. But I think that the thing is that they got comfortable being in a foreign land. If we go back to Genesis and, and back to a guy by the name of Abraham, we remember that God made a promise that there was this this great land that he and his ancestors were going to inherit, but not yet. And so in the time they had to go. Uh, to Egypt and be provided for and now subject to harsh slavery. Let me say it this way. Sometimes I think in life, you and I, we can neglect greater promises because we get comfortable with current provisions. We can neglect greater promises because we get comfortable with current provisions. And the thing that's actually going to move us out of our complacency, out of our comfort, is hardship. 
And the Israelites needed to go through some hardship. Because in that, it would produce movement. It would produce something greater inside of them. And, and I think that maybe that's a challenge for you and I, that, that maybe we have some people here today that are just comfortable, that are complacent with life, that, that are okay just taking care of the immediate things, but God has maybe called you to something greater. There's a greater promise in store. There's something else that He wants to do. But this oppression, it, it carries on. They force them to hard slavery. They get to make bricks. And they have certain quota that they need to be producing all the time. And, and when that doesn't work and the people continue to grow and to multiply, then they start killing the babies, the boys in particular. How harsh is that to, to get to that point? The, the midwives who are doing the deliveries, they have a heart and they, they relent and they do not kill the babies. And then they, they go to, before the, the Pharaoh, the king, and say, hey, these, these women are just hardy. Like, they just, they can do this well. Well, the intensity, like, amps up, and, and all these babies are disposed of. We get to chapter 2. We see of another baby. A baby by the name of Moses. Mom gives birth and hides Moses for three months. Apparently, babies are easier to hide there. But at three months, it's no longer an option. So she puts a basket together and coats it with some stuff to make it waterproof and sets it along the reeds on the Nile River. Now that's important because the Nile River is, is definitely not where you'd want to send a baby. Right, but in the reeds, it's going to kind of hold on there. It's, it's going to be stationary. And, and the timing was, was perfect because Pharaoh's daughter was coming out to cleanse herself and there found baby Moses, had compassion and took him into her house. Well, kind of took him into her house because the baby still needed to be nursed and there just so happened, as you know, God's province always goes in Scripture, it just so happened. Right, that, that there was a provision made and, and baby Moses gets to go back home and stay with mom and get nursed by mom, raised in his own family, but then also raised in the palace of the king. Chapter 2, verse 11. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. Right, it doesn't say the, the Egyptians, it's the Israelites. He went out and he looked upon his people. And he looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And he looked this way, and he looked that, and he, seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. In his fear, even though he was, he was righteous in his indignation, in his fear, he commits premeditated murder and strikes down one of the Egyptians, and then hides him. And there's got to be something more to life than to be set free from this burden of death than to kill an Egyptian in cold-blooded murder. That's Moses. This, this is the same guy that God is going to call just here in another chapter. Like, out of all the people, why this guy? He was, he was afraid, and not only did he commit murder, but a couple other guys found out about it. When he was having a discussion with them, they're like, what, are you going to kill us like you killed him? Oh, I'm not the only one that knows this. And then the word gets to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh puts out a hit on Moses, and Moses does what most of us that would have done in that situation, run, hide, get away, <laughs> right? This is not the place to be. And so he goes to a place known as Midian. It says in uh, verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Verse 23, and during those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. God heard the people cry. And here's another generational reset. The king is, has died. The hit is no longer valid. There's an opportunity 
to return home. And then Moses is called. Probably not the way that we oftentimes think of, but from a bush. Verse 2 in chapter 3, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. He's not that different than you and I. Oh, a siren? Oh, smoke? Hey, I wonder what's going on over there. Maybe we'll just drive out of the way to kind of see what's going on. Oh, a bush on fire. This is interesting. It's not, it's not burning up. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. That's weird, is it not? I mean, first the bush is burning, not consumed, and then the bush talks from out of the bush. And it knows your name. Now, you and I, in our ignorance, would say, hey, you know what? If God called to me out of a burning bush, I would do it. No, you wouldn't. You, just like me, are a coward. And you'd be like, what just happened? Did anybody else hear that? Anybody else see that? And we would begin doing the things that Moses did. Mostly rationalizing every reason not to do it. Because after all, bushes, when they burn, get consumed. And they do not talk. They, they just don't. And yet, this is the reality that he's faced with. And I want us to see that God hears the cry of the people. Verse 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Aside from the ites, you just need to know that their promise was bigger. Their promise was better. And God was hearing their cry. Some of you today, you're in this position. You have gone through some stuff in life. You've made some choices in life. You've, you've gone through, well, an alienation from God, a making excuses, a running and a, and a hiding, and you're looking for something more. And maybe under the oppression of sin and shame, you're crying out and you need to know, just like the Israelites, that God hears your cry. God sees your affliction, and God wants to deliver you out of that. Their deliverer was a guy named Moses. Moses points us to a greater Moses. The name is Jesus. Right? And Jesus is the Savior. He's the great deliverer, taking the people out of slavery to sin and into the freedom of new life, into a greater promised land that is heaven. And some of you are here and you need to know that, but I think that there's probably a greater narrative here for those of us who are in Christ because oftentimes we just need a call to get off our butt. Right? We need a call to get out of our complacency. We need a call to step out of our comfort zone. And we need to realize that the one who calls us also empowers us. So let's continue to read. Chapter 4, verses 10 through 15. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled. 
what, uh, what rationalizations do you come up with? What is it that you can't do? Like you're simply not gifted enough to do that. Because my guess is God would say the same thing to us. Who is it that made you? If I called you, do you not think I could empower you, equip you to do the things that I want you to do? And so you can't talk. Guess what? I'll give you the words to say. It's not that different, right? You and I would probably still sit back and go, I can't have that conversation. I don't know enough. I don't know what to say. What if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? Do you not think that God would empower you? And sometimes getting, an an, uh, getting a question we don't know the answer to drives us to get to know the answer. It helps us to understand more completely. And as soon as we're like, yeah, pick somebody else, most of us do that. We, we may not say it. What we'll do <laughs> is we'll just kind of sit in the background and let other people say yes so that we don't have to. Oh, probably none of you guys, right? <laughs> Nobody here would, would dare just like sit back in a group chat and go, uh, somebody else will do it. Right? So we don't step up. We don't step out. And I believe God's response is much the same as it was with Moses. Sometimes he gets a bit upset, maybe more than just a little bit, when we try to rationalize the things in life. Chapter 5, verse 19 Chapter 5, verse 19, the foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce the number of bricks, your daily tasks, your daily tasks each day. And they met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them. And as they came out from Pharaoh and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge you because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. And then Moses turned to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? I I think that sometimes we think, we haven't gotten to this yet, but we'll hit it next week, that every call from God is going to be a parting of the Red Sea. If God really wants me to do that, oh, miraculously, oh, this is so easy. Moses didn't get called into easy. Moses got called into hard-hearted, complacent, whiny people. Some of you lead in your homes and your workplaces. And you know all about whiny people. Some of you are whiny people. All of us. Can we just admit all of us are whiny people? This is is what he's called to. It's not a life of ease. I'm going to go talk to Pharaoh. He's just going to let us go. Nope. No, he's going to actually make things harder. Hey, make the same amount of bricks. This time go gather your materials too. No lower quota. Harder work. Impossible. Of course the people are going to whine and complain. You would too. If somebody came into your, work, your workplace and said, hey, I need you to do just as much, but I'm going to give you less resources, you would whine and complain. And you would take it to your boss, who would take it to his boss. It just so happened that Moses went to God. What are you doing? I told you, not me. And isn't this the exact posture we would take? First we would try to rationalize it, and then we'd be like, I can't do it. I can't do I'm not going to do it. And that was the burden that he was carrying. But I, I think that you and I need to approach things from a little bit different angle. The hardships that we go through, the kind of things that we would never want to go through again, the kind of things that we probably wouldn't want other people to go through, especially our kids or our grandkids, those things shape us. Those things shape us into the men and the women that we are today. And oftentimes those things that shape us also compel us to action. 
right? The very things that you've been redeemed from, that have, that have wrecked havoc in your life, that creates a stirring in your soul to go and to help other people who have gone through or are going through a similar situation. And the Israelites, caught up in slavery, burdened and oppressed, are going through some hardship. Moses has experienced some hardship. And you and I, in the, in the form of Moses, would say, I can't do that. I'm not qualified to do that. I'm not one of them. Right? Moses was caught in the middle. I am not a Hebrew, and I am not an Egyptian. Right? I am not one of the circumcised, but I don't belong in this camp either. I'm, I just simply don't belong. I'm not good enough. Right? I have a past. I've, I've inflicted pain. I've taken life. I've hurt other people. And, and instead of stepping up, I just ran away and I hid. And I can't do it. And I'm not qualified to do it. And I don't have the words to say to do it. But the very things that happened to Moses, just like with Joseph before him, have actually helped shape his identity and uniquely qualified him to do exactly what God wants him to do. Who else was raised in the palace but yet a Hebrew? To go in and speak into this moment. You see, we can get caught in a foreign land. A land that's meant to be a temporary respite, but not our home. And we get comfortable, and we get complacent, and sometimes we need a fire in our life to compel us to move to remember the mission is greater. Chapter 6, verse 1. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to the Pharaoh. And then he goes on to, to unleash more havoc. I mean, before, Moses is trying to figure out, like, how am I ever going to do this? And he's got the whole, like, hey, my, my staff is a snake, is a staff again. My, my hand is healed, and then it's leprous, and then it's healed again. And, and this water is going to become blood, and hey, everybody's going to listen to you. Well, we forget miracles pretty quickly, unfortunately. We forget all the provisions God has given to us when we get into the next hardship. And all of a sudden, we're back to square one. So this is the Pharaoh. He's getting his heart hardened. And he gets all sorts of weird miracles that are taking place in front of his eyes. Things that are meant to get his attention. Things that you and I would... We could write an amazing horror novel from Scripture. We could put on an amazing haunted house experience just from Scripture. And it would be weird. right? How many of us would not be grossed out if we went home and we pulled back the covers of our bed and there were frogs in our bed? right? We, we go to open our cupboards to get clean dishes and there are frogs. Gnats. Little, obnoxious gnats in our ears, in our noses, in other places. Every drink we go to grab is blood. And every time, like, he just doesn't get it. But every time he's doubling down to Moses, God... Moses, I've called you and I'm going to empower you to do what I've given you to do. And so then the question kind of comes back to us. You see, for some of you, you just simply need to hear today that God hears you. He knows what you're going through and He wants to deliver you out of oppression and the sinful life that you've been trapped in. But many of us, we need to know that God has called us out of the complacency and the comfortable life we've found in Egypt because he's got so much more in store for us. But it means that we're going to have to move. And it means that we're going to have to have faith, that we're going to have to trust him with every step that we take. Throughout this uh, year, I've been trying to give you three key questions to help you process the stuff we've been talking about. And so here are the three key questions today. Number one, what is God calling you to do? 
What is God calling you to do? What's His unique call on your life? You probably know. You've probably been digging in your heels. You've probably been trying to run away. That leads me to question number two. How have you been rationalizing your disobedience? How have you been rationalizing your disobedience? Because we do. Pretty good at making excuses. And number three, what's one step that you can take today to trust in God's power in your life? What's one step of obedience that you can take today to help you better trust in God's power in your life? My hope is that at Connection Christian Church, like we can train up and develop more leaders, right? Leaders to serve in the ministry here, but leaders to serve in our in our families, right? We need men and women who are going to lead well in their families. Maybe you weren't led well. Maybe you've never really been discipled and, and to trust, but you have an opportunity to do a generational reset in your life. And your family is going to be better because God stepped in at this moment and you were brave enough to take the lead. You were brave enough to go against culture. You were brave enough to go against your family of origin. You were brave enough to step into obedience with God. But it's going to take steps of faith to make that happen. Right? We need leaders who are going to step into their workplace. You don't need to get called to a different place to work. Right? But marketplace ministry is real. God, how can you use the, the environment I'm in right now? How can you use the people of influence in my life right now and allow me opportunities to minister to them right where I'm at today? God, how can you use me? And I hope here that three, five years from now, we can be sending off groups of people to start new churches because the hard reality is that more churches are closing every year than are getting started right? Churches are, a lot of them, unhealthy. And they're failing to meet the needs of the community that they've been placed in. Not God. God is not unfaithful. He's not unwilling. He's not unable. But sometimes churches hit a lifespan, right? And that's true across the globe, across the country, and across the state of Nebraska. And if not us, then who? Right? And I want you to know that, the, that God may be putting a unique call on your life today. And you might think, like, not me. <laughs> Surely not me. I don't have the words to say. I have some bad experiences. But maybe God is going to use them in a powerful way to do uniquely what only you can do under His power. But will you step in faith to make that happen? What does that look like for you? Hmm. Well, as uh, you prepare for your week, just know like the next 10 chapters, that's your reading assignment for this week. It'll get you through Exodus. Uh, This particular series, we're going to hit Exodus twice, the first uh, 10, the second 10, and then we're going to go to Deuteronomy, and it's going to be like the front end and the back end of Deuteronomy to give us kind of that timeline feel of this march through Exodus, and I hope you'll join us for that. Will you pray with me? Father, we, uh, we are full of excuses. And as much as we don't want it, we need people to call us out. We need you to call us out. You've already empowered us. You've already gifted us uniquely to do what it is that you want us to do. Help us to trust in that. Not to tuck tail and run not to hide, to make excuses, to rationalize our way out or to sit back and wait for someone else to do it. But Father, help us to be men and women of faith. We're going to trust you as we take one step and then another to obediently follow after you and to take us out of our comfort and out of our complacency and step us into a greater promise under your provision. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.